chair there. You advance here. Cool. Speak to the mic. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Zach Radizak from Towns of Prairie uh, LTR. As a reward for making it to the end, here's a picture of a baby bison grazing during a monarch migration. Sorry, Forrest, we don't have your music. It's not quite as dramatic, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a late autumn cap too. We don't usually have babies interacting with the monarchs. Um, anyways, our biggest news this year is that we are up for our midterm site review in just three weeks here. So we are getting prepared for that and uh, still looking forward to the science council. So in terms of thinking about uh, scaling at our site, you know, folks at Kanza do all the kind of typical culprits for cross-scale work, whether it's process-based modeling, cross-site sampling to contextualize our results and a whole lot of cross LTR syntheses. So if you're looking for collaborators on those kind of things, you've got all those names up there. Um, for us actually scaling within our site has been a bit of a challenge because we have a large number of large experimental units. And for us, one of our major conservation concerns is this woody plant encroachment of native trees and shrubs into the grassland. So if you take an area that's burned every two years on the right here, uh, and then an area that's been burned very infrequently on the left, it can rapidly transition to a, a completely new type of ecological state. And so sampling this has been hard because these woody thickets that form are basically impenetrable. So we have incredibly high stem density. Within the understory, we have just a myriad of different thorny plants or the shrubs themselves are incredibly thorny. That understory is underlain by poison ivy. And these uh, shrubs are basically a hotbed of tick behavior. They draw in deer and small mammals. You can easily walk into one shrub, come out with 10 to 20 ticks on your clothing. So it's, it's fairly difficult to sample this vegetation. So for instance, if we send a decent sized field crew out, they can maybe map out 20 of our 50 or, I'm sorry, 12 of our 50 or so experimental units across Kanza. We've got over 50 ex experimental units that combine different types of fire and grazing by bison. And so if we're doing that, we can only sample them every five years or so. And if you imagine those conditions, our retention of undergraduates or graduate students doing this work is going to be quite low. Um, and so what we found recently though, is with the advent of, I mean, machine learning has just become so incredibly accessible. Um, and then we have a lot of great uh, flyover data from NEON. We can in a single field season now map out pretty much all of our woody vegetation on site at an incredibly high uh, resolution, two by two meters and with very high accuracy. So that's about 95% accuracy on a per pixel basis. And really the secret to that success is the, the LIDAR that we get from NEON AOP, and then just having very large training data sets. So we have a, a training data set that's about 300,000 samples that we use to train our machine learning model. And so um, it's giving us like a new view of just what's happening on our site. For instance, this is a location where we have uh, the absence of Plains bison for 30 years. And you can see something kind of remarkable. You have a watershed that's burned every single year and a watershed burned every two years. They're basically completely devoid of woody vegetation whatsoever. But you make this super tiny change in our management and burn every three to four years and the ecosystem transitions to being basically 50% shrub cover. Uh, so this little change makes a huge difference in what we see on our landscape. The other thing we see though, is we have areas that are basically completely devoid of grassland. So that leaves us with questions like, are those viable habitat for consumers uh, or are they too small to support consumers? Uh, I'll quickly just say that bison also alter this relationship. So um, we, we know why this is, it's due to bison behavior, which we gathered from GPS collars and basically they promote woody plant encroachment at uh, high fire frequencies to a small degree. So what's been really exciting though about high resolution remote sensing is it's allowing us to do kind of cross scale interactions in the biological sense. So basically trying to cross correlate producers with consumers and things like hydrology. So when we combine these like remote sense woody uh, plant products with 10 years of spatial temporal data of bird occupancy, you can see that really small amounts of woody plant encroachment from zero to 20% cover can result in a 50% reduction in grassland bird habitat. Uh, what this obscures, in fact, is that if you look at trees, a single tree basically casts a shadow where the 10 hectares or so surrounding that tree will not basically be occupied by grassland obligate birds. So the small speckling of woody plant vegetation can have a really big impact. The other thing that's been interesting to use this for is thinking about ecohydrology. Um, we've seen that we have a decrease in our stream flow and I'm out of time, but the, the punchline here is that woody plant encroachment in the broader watershed rather than the riparian zone seems to be responsible for this large decrease in, in stream flow. So uh, find me if you wanna talk about machine learning and remote sensing, because we're very new to this, but really excited about it too. Thank you.